I am happy that I'm here for the first time. Uh, I experienced that it is, uh, let's say, a constructive chaos, what we experience here. <laughs> uh, and also what uh, the traffic is concerned, it's very difficult to get from one place to the other. But I have to assure you that the uh, Swiss trains are on time. <laughs> I took the train and it was uh, it worked perfectly. I, I got the train up as <laughs> yeah, well. That's, uh, that, that's good. But, uh, but uh, frankly and, and more sincerely, uh, I think uh, uh, what is good about uh, the WEF is the, that we have the chance uh, to speak about our most, more, most important challenges, also mm -hmm. with Chatham House rules, yeah. which means that I think that many times if we are ready to, to be confronted with reality and with the challenges we face, even if we don't all agree, uh, we can share with each other our thoughts uh, uh, seriously and uh, have, an, have, have a real exchange of views. And uh, for me, it is always very helpful if I understand uh, the reasons behind uh, uh, the uh, position of a given country. Mm. And also, when we are in Davos, we are speaking, of course, also about uh, the representatives of uh, economy uh, and mm. of the business sector, which is very important. Um, there are some important messages that you want to convey here as well, as well as listening to what other people's thoughts are. If, if there was one issue that was really most important to you here that you want to just talk about and get a conversation going about, what would that be? Of course, we spoke about the war in Ukraine. We are a direct neighbor to Ukraine, so I also participated in a, an interesting panel about the war in Ukraine, uh, which is not an avoidable uh, issue, and it shouldn't be. But also, what, what is the most important topic I would bring here? It is also a long-lasting problem, and that is demography. Yeah. Because I think if we talk about the potential of Europe, or let's say the developed world, then we also have to face reality. Then. In all of our countries, we are facing demographic decline, we are facing fertility problems, uh, and there is a huge fertility gap in our countries. So that means that young people would like to have families, but they won't have at the end of the day. And I think that we have to understand the reasons behind and we have to support young people to be able to have a professional and a family life in the mm. same time. And also being a, a woman leader, being the first woman president of my country and being also a mother of three children, mm. for me it is also an important message to spread that uh, these two should not be necessarily confronted with each other. What do you think the biggest challenge is on that front then? Is it a societal issue? Is it attitudes are changing? Or is it purely economic, as a lot of people probably think it is? It is surely economic, partly, uh, yeah. because uh, I'm an economist by profession, and it's, maybe it's a little bit uh, tough to say, but it's true that uh, in our welfare societies, there is no economic reason for having children. Uh, those who have children ha have economic disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis those who don't have children. So what we would like to do, for example, in Hungary, to decrease or eliminate this economic disadvantage uh, of the families uh, raising children vis-a-vis -vis those uh, who decided not to have children. Uh, but also, it's not only financial. Uh, it is, I think, also a cultural issue, and uh, it, is, it is a question if we are able to, to balance uh, this uh, family and professional life. So there are many methods with which we try to overcome this issue. For example, in Hungary, women with at least four children don't pay any personal income tax ever in their lives. But this is just one, one element of our pro-family policies. Uh, and that's an incredibly important issue, and it's great you're bringing it to Davos as well. You also mentioned the importance of Ukraine uh, and the huge role that Hungary has played, as you say, as a neighbor as well. Uh, and I think all the countries close to Ukraine have either suffered or had to take on enormous challenges because of this devastating war of the last two years as well. Why do you think that Hungary, a magnificent nation that has done so much to help the situation, help the Ukrainian people, sees itself at odds with perhaps some of its Western allies, perhaps some of its EU allies, on so many issues regarding supporting Hungary? Why is it that Prime Minister Orban seems to be almost on a daily basis at loggerheads with, with, with perhaps some other members of the, the EU27. So first of all, uh, I think that we have much more in common than there are uh, controversies between the positions of Hungary and uh, uh, other EU member states, uh, because uh, our uh, our position vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Ukraine and Russia is the same as uh, that of the other 26 uh, EU member states. So we condemn Russia's aggression against Ukraine from the first moment on. We are very clear on that. We are trying our utmost in order to support Ukraine. And when we speak about uh, the geographic setting of Hungary, which means that we are a direct neighbor to Ukraine, we also shouldn't forget that uh, we have an ethnic minority 
of Hungarian ethnic uh, ethnics uh, living on the territory of Ukraine, 150,000 people, which is for us a decisive number. So we are not only indirectly hit by the war in Ukraine, but actually directly we are losing uh, lives of uh, Hungarian uh, Hungarians or the members of the Hungarian ethnic minority. So I think that uh, when the substance is concerned, that our then our position is uh, the same as uh, that of the European Union. When it's about the methods, uh, then the positions may differ. But I think that we should rather concentrate on what we have in common sure. than what we don't exactly say, uh, share the same views. In. I, and that's absolutely important to look at what is in common. But but at the moment. The Ukrainian delegation, and I was here for the NSA meeting on Sunday as well, is crying out for more support, both diplomatically and militarily, and of course economically as well. There is an accusation from some in Europe that it is Hungary that is holding up that financing as well. How can that gap be bridged between the view of Hungary and Prime Minister Orban and that of the other EU members? Ukraine needs support, that's for sure, and we have to further support Ukraine. I completely share that to you personally and Hungary as a country as well. Uh, so that is the most important. And uh, I, I, I just very much hope that we will find uh, the method how to su further support Ukraine uh, financially at the next uh, EU Council. Do, do you uh, think that actually that there will be some form of combination of views? I mean, I, Mr. Orban on one side at the moment, the rest of the EU, the other, it, it, it's, it's not a comfortable position for Hungary to be in, to be against all the, the friends and allies, is it? Well, it's not about being uh, feeling comfortable or not feeling comfortable, even if I'm not in the shoes of uh, the prime minister. Uh, but I think what uh, we should again uh, uh, concentrate on yeah. is that we have to support uh, Ukraine. But I also have to, to say something or add something. I just had a, a good discussion with the, the foreign minister of Ukraine. I was in Kiev two times in the last yeah. year. Uh, I met President Zelensky several times. Uh, I, th I, I completely understand uh, their position. I I completely understand that they seek for support from everybody at the largest extent they can. Maybe that is exactly what I would do if I were in their yeah. shoes. So it's very difficult to, to imagine what we would do if we were uh, Ukrainians. But also in the meantime, I am the president of Hungary yeah. and we live still in a peaceful country. And we still in Switzerland, we live in a peaceful country. And that goes for Europe and that goes for the NATO countries as well. So what I just would like to emphasize is that we are not at war. The yeah. NATO countries the EU countries are not at war. Uh, so even if we support and we keep further supporting Ukraine, we shouldn't get militarily involved in this war and we should avoid the escalation of the, the war and we shouldn't find ourselves in a third world war and 2024 shouldn't be uh, uh, 1914. Uh, uh, yeah. So it should be 2024 should be the year of peace rather than the peace of uh, the year of war. I, I almost have to wrap up this interview. But I must ask you one more question. Do you see a route to peace at the moment? It's very difficult for many of us who have been observing this for the last two years or the last 10 years since Crimea was invaded. Very difficult to see the route either diplomatically or militarily. Do, do, you, do you see a way through this? That is, uh, I think, now the $1 million question. Yeah. And there I also have to say that it, it is uh, crucial that we find a path towards peace, but it will be very difficult, or I would even say impossible, to reach peace negotiations be, uh, without involving both partners or all partners. Yeah. So without uh, even speaking uh, to Russia or try to sit Russia also to the negotiating table, it I don't think what will happen. So I think that we have to find and figure out the way how we among ourselves uh, uh, reach a consensus and then how we can approach also E either through China or s through somebody else yeah. or directly uh, Russia to be able to, to negotiate with them because peace talks, negotiation, ceasefire, and that leads uh, finally to a peace which we all want.